too tired. I, I was trying to make a Watson Sherlock joke, but I'm too tired for the, even completing that. Hey, Vanessa. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Adam. Not asking you how you feel. I can see it on your face. Uh, yes. <laughs> also, I encourage people to dispense with asking people how they feel. I know. You hate it. Is, Although I, when I do ask culture. you, I do generally want to know the answer. I'm not I, I actually... Don't, I don't think you're... I don't think you don't. But you mostly do that to torture me. In mm-hmm. the same way that I insist on people using my full name in professional settings so that they have to go through the whole thing and see how uncomfortable it makes them. Mm-hmm. Speaking of uncomfortable things, first of all, welcome to Uncertain Things. Second, there is a war in the Middle East. In case you don't know, this Saturday, Hamas combatants infiltrated Israel and carried out the most brutal massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. And I think it's just worth being very clear, especially for Americans like me, who may be a bit more ignorant of the situation. And it's, it is very difficult to, to understand. But <laughs> Hamas is not synonymous with Palestinians, right? There is a distinction between Palestinian people and Hamas, which is a political party slash terrorist organization, rules over Palestinians in in Gaza. And you can distinguish that from other political parties or representatives like the Palestinian Liberation Authority. But I, I just think that Americans tend to conflate <laughs> Hamas with Palestinians. I think it's very important to have this distinction in, in your minds. Yes. The Palestinians are the people. The people who are vying for national independence and have a long and complicated and bloody and tragic history with Israel where mutual atrocities have been commenced over the years. Hamas is a political group. It is a terrorist organization. It is a dictatorship, a a theocratic, kleptocratic coterie of mobsters supported by Qatar and Iran whose sole purpose, as explicitly described in its charter, is not to provide welfare for the Palestinians who live under its reign, but to purge the land of Israel from Jews. They have been ruling the little strip of land called Gaza since 2006, after Israel has unilaterally extricated all its forces and its presence from it in order to enable Palestinian independent rule in that territory. Immediately following this disengagement, this unilateral disengagement, Hamas was elected into office democratically and then less democratically went on to exterminate all opposition, all members of the opposition party who fled to the West Bank, literally throwing them out of the windows, and from that moment on, never held a single democratic election, has oppressed the people of Gaza, and has devoted all resources, all resources that the Gazans have been able to accrue either by work or through foreign aid, and devoted it exclusively to develop a war machine against Israeli civilians. In the years that followed, Hamas used its independence to launch a barrage of rockets targeting civilian Israeli cities around the Strip and further into the country. Civilian cities. In response, Israel implemented a blockade to prevent the flow of weapons and terrorists into the country. This Saturday, Hamas death squads have infiltrated the apparently quite porous blockade, raided civilian towns around the country, and executed a full-scale massacre. They have butchered over 1,300 people, most of them civilian, 
and counting, by the way. They have injured, maimed, tortured, and brutalized over 3,300 people, mostly civilian, including old women, children, even toddlers. They have kidnapped over 150 people, mostly civilian. And it was not just your run-in-the-mill orchestrated slaughter. This was a proper blood orgy. And we know that because in addition to the brutality, the Hamas militants went the extra step of filming themselves and then sharing it publicly. Proudly. Because they were proud of it. And because they thought it's going to break the resolve of Israelis. And lastly, because terrorists want to get a response. The internal logic of terrorism is to provoke their enemies into an overreaction, to push your enemy into commencing a monstrous atrocity that you believe they're capable of, to turn them into the monsters you see them as. The proliferation of these images on social media is part of the strategy. It's not simply because Hamas wants to own the hashtag dead babies space. Sorry if I'm getting dark. This is, uh, this has been, this has been a week and this is how I cope with things. So if somehow you missed it, Adam is Israeli. I don't know how you missed it, it but if somehow you did, this is hitting very close to home. Literally. Literally. And if you want my more immediate reaction, I, I had a conversation about this as the news was still coming out, just to show you how early it was. At that point, we knew of only 250 dead with Jonah Goldberg on the Remnant podcast. So you should listen to that for the context, my immediate thoughts about the Israeli response, the mood in Israel, and the future of the Middle East. If you want even bleaker thoughts, I shared them to the private audience of the Dispatch members on a recording of Dispatch Live yesterday. So, this conversation is mm, less an intellectual inquiry of the type that we usually try to achieve, as our friend Josh puts it, an embrace and grappling with epistemological uncertainty. And more so, uh, a need for some catharsis. Although I will and, say that the beginning of this conversation, you were remarkably buttoned up. It's only towards the end where you started to let the, the, the... Where the shirt comes off. The buttons fall, yeah. So Vanessa here is indulging me in her tender attentiveness, but I needed somebody in whose righteous anger I could bask. Mm. Yeah, I'm not great for righteous anger. I'm not your go-to <laughs> gal. For that. Though I'm training you. I'm trying to yeah, train you. Yeah, slowly. I texted, um, I think, a day or two after the, the news started coming out to Eli Lake. I, yes, I told him, you are my source for wisdom and catharsis on this area, region. Please join. And he said, yes. And the following conversation will be that. But I just need to give it some context. First, like I said, this is not the sort of heady, self-inquisitive type of conversation that we keep trying to do. This is a little more for my soul, a little soul purging or cleansing for myself and for anybody like me who might be in need of it, which I suspect there are quite a few. I think there is some value in it because we try to offer some philosophical hygiene, I might say, I might call it, but let me get to this in a second. I want to preamble all of it with one clear point. Regardless of what we think about this current incident, regardless of the horror and rage that we feel entitled to at this point, nothing justifies any kind of bloodthirst or bloodlust in retaliation. Our 
tone of rage should not be at any point interpreted as an endorsement of reckless behavior. In fact, one thing that I keep reminding myself in these moments is how right, rightfully we should cling to the, the moral hypocrisies that we define ourselves by, even if we don't always live up to them, because it's in aspiring to them that we become better people. Those hypocrisies and those fantasies that we have about ourselves that stop us from turning into the monsters who have committed this pogrom mm -hmm. over the weekend. So, and and just to in, in case in case it isn't clear, you're talking about the the hypocrisies being the the higher standards we hold ourselves to, even though we never actually meet them. And you can point to a million examples of how you've never actually you as a person, you as a country, have never actually lived up to your ideals. Exactly. But the ideals are still meaningful. Meaningful, not because we live up to them, but because they keep shaping us and curtailing the boundaries of legitimate action. And I think we should all the more stick to them when faced with such unadulterated brutality and savagery as we are now. And I will also say that I have many thoughts about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I have both intellectual, high-level ideas about the problems in Israel and Palestine, and certainly... Plenty of emotions for both people. And my feelings about both sides as a culture, as a society, as a political system are complex to say the least. I don't have simple, simple colored ideas or feelings about either. And... The complexity of the Israeli situation, I've talked about at least in two or three podcasts in the past here, and you can listen to my talk with Khabib Gour on the Dispatch podcast, or with Tomer Persico, both here and on the Dispatch podcast, and Nadav And because of all these complexities, because of my understanding of the tragic situation in Israel and Palestine... I usually refrain from making overly moralistic, simplistic comments on this matter. And I think even in this case, I try to refrain. I have no, there is no grayness in me about the genocidal murderers that were sent by Hamas. And I don't have any grayness in me about Hamas as an institution. I think it's the darkest type of regimes. It is the epitome of tyranny and brutality. I have no dimensionality, no richness, no nuance to offer them. However, that's not the, the rage that I needed to exercise. Where my, my immediate anger goes to are to the people who have trained themselves by practice and through long sophisticated words to undermine their own sense of morality and under the guise of freedom and justice have aligned themselves with the murdering, butchering, oppressive despotism of Hamas. And of course, I'm talking about drum rolls, the American left. I, I, I have one more thing to get out of the way. I will also at some point probably want to talk about the, the other side of my rage, which goes to the Netanyahu government and Israel's strongman politics that have contributed to the hollowing out of Isra the Israeli security apparatus and the Israeli system into the state that it is now, where it is barely standing. We always thought that everything was held by duct tape in Israel, but it, it's not just duct tape. It's a 
castle of cardboard held by duct tape and to realize how true this is and how much damage has been caused to this fragile, brittle construct was some sort of red pilling, I think, for me. Even though I always thought that. The, the change from theorizing about it to fully understanding how bad it is is something that I'm, I don't think I've really started grappling with. And, and I will. And Israeli society will. And the people who have hollowed out our country and have led to its destruction will. But this is another time. And another thing that will, will, will be dealt with another time is the same strongman, facile politics that we see, that, we, that has hollowed out Israel happening on the right, who try to exploit this horror to play their culture war games domestically. Okay, I think I'm done with caveats. So with mm-hmm. those things we'll deal with another time. Today is devoted to the fucking American left and their response to the pogrom. Yes. And for perhaps obvious reasons, I am a little less active in this conversation between Eli and Adam. Um, But I did have some thoughts. Uh, So if you are curious to get my take on the situation in a little bit more depth, stay tuned after the conversation with Eli. Um, But yeah, let's not delay the catharsis any longer. Shall we get into it? So I'm actually going to start with asking our guest because we have returning time. Returning guest. Phenomenal returning guest. How many hours of sleep are you on? How many hours of sleep am I on? Um, Four. There's a shared insomnia um, among certain people currently who are just dealing with the unfolding situation in Israel. And I... I, I just figured that I need to do something for this and on certain things. I couldn't figure out what. And the only person I had some notion of wanting to hear from is you. I, I texted you. I said, you are my uh, source for reason and catharsis. Well, so. Adam, I got to tell you, um, your podcast that you did with Jonah on the dispatch skiff was fantastic. It was really good. I agree. Thank you. Um, so this is un- completely unstructured, and this is just about trying to process things. Let's start with your current crusade, uh, Eli. You you are, um, when you're not writing or going on podcasts or actually doing um, thorough, deep analysis, you seem to be hunting down people on Twitter and and, and calling out their moral uh, decrepitude. Um, illiteracy. Um, turpitude. Yes. Illiteracy. <laughs> Um, tell me about this. Well, I mean, listen, Twitter or X has become, in some ways, uh, it's become like useful again because yeah. it's a great way to see the videos and to sort of catch up with what's happening. It's something that I care about deeply as a, as a Jewish American, uh, as Zionist, somebody who's been to Israel many times. And then you then you encounter people who call themselves progressives, who are the first, you know, to whip up campaigns because a tweet from five years ago was interpreted in such a way, not just saying, you know, the usual pablum about, you know, de-escalations and ceasefires, but reveling in what they call decolonization, resistance, um, kind of the fusing lies about Israel and this this occupation or the blockade and with with um as a as a justification for a pogrom and um I I have said this on Twitter I've said it on a couple podcasts the democratic socialists of America are the national socialists of America because they have celebrated Nazis now it's interesting today sensing the heat from that despicable rally of, on Sunday in New York City and other cities. So just context for people who, who might mistake this statement as just uh, as just heated rhetoric or vitriol. The DSA has... The NSA. 
<laughs> the newly reconstituted NSA has <laughs> promoted, celebrated, and defended an event planned for Sunday in New York in support of Palestinian resistance a day after the yeah. worst Jewish pogrom since the Holocaust took place. And the issue is not, I want a Palestinian state. It's not, <laughs> I, I, you know, I mourn the loss of, of children in Gaza. It's not that. And, and, and let me, let me yeah. ca- caveat within caveat. This should be also clear because we're just jumping into it with our moral outrage. But this is something that I'm, I'm almost tired of having to explain, but yeah. we will do it for the sake of, you know, the sane listeners who are just genuinely clueless about the, the region or about our perspectives on this. Or the reaction that's been happening. Or the yeah. reaction and everything. But let's just say it out front. This is not about the, the relationship between Israel and uh, Palestinian uh, would-be state. This is not, and it's certainly not in imputation of the Palestinian as a people or and certainly and certainly certainly not the Gaz- Gazans who probably suffer the worst of all worlds in their current circumstances there are probably some of the tr- most tragic uh people in the entire u- u- human world right now amen in, yes so let's just be clear about this the Gazans are in a tragic situation and my heart truly breaks. It has been breaking for them before this atrocity. It has been breaking for them from for the horrors that they have to suffer under Hamas and um and, and in relations to the Israeli state. And it's and it certainly breaks for what is about to happen to them now. This has nothing to do with what we're talking about. And mm-hmm. the people who went to the quote unquote um defend Palestinian resistance or strengthen Palestinian resistance on Sunday also have nothing to do with that because their defense is not about Palestinian liberation. It's not about justice. It's not about um, human rights. It's certainly, certainly not about human rights, but it's about showing support for Hamas, who has conducted the worst atrocity, the worst Jewish pogrom since the Holocaust. Uh, It would be like holding a rally for solidarity with the German people the day after Kristallnacht. That's what it is. That's why right. I call them National Socialists of America. Now, um, a couple points that I think are very important here. Point number one, the rally itself, as well as many of the tweets, as well as Black Lives Matter of Chicago putting out the graphic of, of, of one of these um, subhuman demons on a glider... Uh, saying free Palestine. Um, that the paragliders who, who, who parachuted into a, uh, music, a festival. music festival yes. in, in the south of Israel where civilians, yes. were two, 300 civilians were, or more than 300 civilians were partying, inebriated, and, and the paragliders surrounded them and executed them. On the spot, 300 people Murder civilians murdered by those paragliders that BLM puts as their newfound Che Guevara symbol of, of liberation. Correct. Now, so on one level, that of course is endorsing uh, pogrom. It is endorsing, uh, you know, a lust for Jewish blood. And it's disgusting on that. But on another level, it is deeply, deeply racist against Palestinians because it assumes the Palestinian people are as savage right. as the barbarians right. who rule over them. And I, we can never... I, and this is why I really am at the point now where I will call out names. Ali Abu Nima, Max Blumenthal, Jewish Voices for Peace, who are now Jewish Voices for Pogroms. These organizations are traitors to the Palestinian people, let alone, uh, you know, allies of 21st century Nazis. They are traitors to the Palestinian people because the Palestinians are weaker than Israel. And this act, this atrocity, will isolate them politically, diplomatically. It will result in a very heavy military retaliation. Um, it will further immiserate p- 
Palestinians living in Gaza. What's more, I think it is clarifying because this is the only proof you need as to why there are border controls that are tightly monitored of what comes in and out of Gaza. Because these thugs, these savages, had if they're truly under a blockade, how in the world did they get bulletproof vests, advanced drones, rockets, missiles, submachine guns, you name it. So, I mean, that's the thing, is that they're saying the blockade is why you are getting this response. And it is a total inversion of logic. No, the blockade is because this is what happens. Now, I mean, at this point, I just think the only humane solution is regime change in Gaza, full stop. I mean, I would go further. I think you need to you need to have an ultimatum to the Qataris and the Turks to, to hand over their leaders. You have to basically end this disgusting organization. And I think that the Iranians, if these reports are true, not just the Wall Street Journal, now the Washington Post, although there's some differences on whether the Iranians gave the, the green, green light. Moment. Yeah. But there's, yes. there has now been some reporting and good reporting on the fact that the Iranians helped plan and the operation and train these operatives. Um, they need to pay a, a price as well. And it is absurd that there could ever be a nuclear deal with Iran at this point. There can't be. And it's, it's, it, I understand all the arguments. And this is not, I don't want to put people who I have policy disagreements on Iran. They're certainly not in any close to the same category of the Cretans who um, are, are reveling in, in the murder of Jews. But there has to be an understanding. There is no formula that will entice these barbarians into the civilized world, full stop. They are not our only problem. We have Russia, we have China, we have a, a world that is a very dangerous place right now. But you can't, we don't get to choose. We don't get to say, oh, well, you know, maybe if we did this formula, or if we if we did this transfer, or if we had this, or, you know, we had, we allowed 6,000 instead of 7,000, whatever. No, 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 no. They're, they're, they're dirt bags, and ultimately, the goal, we can't do it right away. We shouldn't invade Iran. But I'm saying the goal has to be democratic revolution in Iran. We cannot live in a world with these with these barbarians. Full stop. We can't. Israel's the canary in the coal mine, but we just cannot. And we just have to accept that. The distinction between foreign policy disagreements and uh, theory behind the Iran deal and placating Iran somewhat and... On the other hand, what do you call the Cretans, the, the BLM, the, the newly constituted NSA, these, this is actually really important. Yeah. Because the, on the far side, we have something that at, at its worst is um, Chamberlainian appeasement. Yeah. Because appeasement is not about, yeah, I, 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 we want to turn a blind we eye to We don't put Chamberlain in the same category as Hitler. Exactly. Right. And, Cham and the, if you want to be historically as fair as possible, there was, you can understand Chamberlain's perspective. You can understand the people who try to reach an Iran deal thinking that this really is the best way to mitigate um, Iran's progress on getting nuclear weapons, while at the same time limiting American involvement and being able to focus more energy on bigger threats like China, potentially Russia. There is, there is a logic that they followed. It's, uh, that, that was not nearly let the let them kill Jews. NSA and BLM clearly are saying, let them kill Jews. Not only let them kill Jews, please kill Jews. This is what freedom looks this like. Is, this is what this decolonization is, yes, is, looks like. Right. And it's it's not just a few like people on on Twitter. I think this is the thing that's like painful to watch. It's not like a few nutty people it's, just it's espousing. Not, it's not, it's not, it's not like, a single BLM supporter that has been not picked to represent the entire movement. No. We're talking about BLM Chicago, one of the yeah. largest branches. We're talking about the New York DSA. We're talking about the entire the, DSA. You know, the entire DSA supported it. So did their college wing. And we're talking about uh, universities. Politicians. We're talking, and we're talking about all major elite universities who had 
chapters of, of, of national organizations signing letters saying in different tones the same idea. We are okay with the massacre of Jews because this is what our twisted version of decolonization looks like, which means your twisted version of decolonization is akin to Nazism. Yes. Ow, well stated. And I'll just say this. The irony, of course, is that only three years ago, these people had enormous cultural and political influence because they were seen as the sort of arbiter of what was and was not racist. And here they are engaging in the oldest prejudice in the book. Now, that tell, that I believe that they have just, they have impeached their, their, their moral credibility. But I would go further. I would say that anybody who tolerates them at this point if you know what I'm saying, if, if you're in, if you're not interested in the Middle East and God bless you, if you are not interested in the Middle East, you know, great. And you just are you you like the socialist because, um, you know, they have the right position on, you know, the, the General Motors strike. Healthcare. Healthcare or whatever. OK, you, you it's it's now no longer OK. You have to treat these people like the Ku Klux Klan. You can't say, well, you know, I agree with them on this, so I'm going to partner and they're going to be in my coalition, you know, on climate justice or something. No, find other partners. They should be the political equivalent of Ebola. Totally toxic. They are COVID. Um, And, you know, there was an interesting thing that happened with in regard to some of these groups at Harvard that signed this disgusting, you know, statement or whatever. Bill Ackman, who is a hedge fund guy, went on Twitter and said, I'd like to know who their names are so we don't hire them. And then, of course, people like Mehdi Hassan and others were like, oh, that's cancel culture and McCarthyism and blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. And these are the same people who were cheering the canceling of people for like tweets they wrote when they were 17 years old. That they can well, st- denying that cancel culture is even a legitimate concept. Exactly, and now they're now they're decrying it, which is you know they're you know you know cry me a river. But on but I'm saying that no, from the river to the sea. Yeah, exactly. Like just replace Jews with blacks. Okay, I mean it's, it's completely unacceptable, and that's the part as diaspora Jew, as a diaspora Jew, where I say this is a scary moment. We saw the last Gaza war, by the way. We thought they were like kind of Palestinian Americans, but you saw in LA, like they were like roving around looking for Jews to beat up that had yarmulkes on. That was disturbing. That was very bad. We saw it in the 2000 uh, teens when there was a Gaza war in France where there were people who attacked a synagogue. Um, But now you're seeing organizations that at least, you know, until recently had a bit of political capital on the left and now it's like you have to, you, you, you know, we have to, it's the time for choosing. You cannot stand anywhere near DSA, NSA, sorry, um, at this point and, um, and be a, you know, part of a respectable, decent society. I may be, you know, I may be outvoted and I'm, there might be people who will, you know, tolerate it. But at least as far as I'm concerned, I'm, I, that's, that's how I see it, you know. That's exactly what I've been feeling over the past four or five days. I, I don't know. It's, it's all one flat day. Yeah. I, I'm almost grateful for this cleanse that I've, I've been undergoing, this intellectual cleanse of, I am no longer in any sense feeling obligated to put myself through the twists of explaining exactly what nuance in these organizations I find reprehensible while also giving credit to the intellectual layers that make it a legitimate or even a worthy um, being in our in public in public affairs not anymore this is this is easy you have endorsed massacre yep. you are pro holocaust the end you are no longer a legitimate organization and we just recorded advisory opinions and at the end I got into a conversation with David and Sarah about how every single form of anti-Semitism was never abstract hatred. It always had beef. I call it it's the it's the the protocols of the beefs of Zion. There was always something that that justified the extermination of Jews, whether it was religious justification or economic justification in the case of national socialism. They were the reason why they're the reason why our economy is stagnating and therefore we need to get rid of them. So today it's decolonization. But the fact that you have a story to tell about why beheading babies is legitimate 
does not does not make it, it any less of not just anti-Semitic, genocidal yeah. than Nazism. Um, so good, we're agreeing on that. But um, I I was wondering how do we manage this pivot now that Israel is going to attack in Gaza and the pictures that are going to come from Gaza are, are going to be horrific and it's going to be stomach churning and so, and they're probably going to be some, some actual war crimes in the sense that I would even decry as, okay, Israel fucked up here. This is likely to happen. And within two days, four days, the world is going to turn and the, the ghouls and the NSA are going to say, ha, we told you so. Democrats are going to fall in line, probably, and Israeli legitimacy, this brief moment of grace, is going to vanish. Yeah, to put it in your words, Hamas will have won because Israel will become the monsters that they have have oh, provoked I mean, this them is, this into is the being. The purpose of terrorism, right? The purpose, of, the logic of terrorism, isn't to merely terrorize the population, but to terrorize them into overreaction so that they become the demons that they want, that, that the terrorists want to portray them as, that the terrorists see, see them as. Let the whole world see the monster that was within. I'm, I'm not so sure this time. I think, they've, hmm. I think they, may have, they may have stepped over a line. Um, if this was just another rocket war, I would agree with you. But it's not another rocket war. We, we, have, un, we have voluminous evidence of this pogrom, it is probably the most recorded pogrom in history. It was advertised by Hamas. And I am not in Israel, but I have been talking to friends in Israel. And the mood there is that there will be no tolerance for anything but full eradication of Hamas. And Netanyahu is not in a strong political position. He, no. even if he wanted to maneuver his way into appeasing Joe Biden, if he changed his tune, um, I don't know that he would have the political space to do so. So I guess I would say that I don't see it working this time. I also think that there is sometimes a reductionist view of the response to these things, which is to say that it's natural for human beings to focus on the negative comments. I mean, I certainly, like, I, I have written pieces that I'm very proud of and have gotten wonderful feedback, and then I will focus on, you know, the, the two one readers who tell me that I'm an idiot. And <laughs> I think something like that happens on a larger scale in Israel, which is to say that in the period that European public opinion and opinion within the Democratic Party has turned in some ways against Israel... I think they've made new friends in India. They've made new friends in Kenya. They've made new friends also in these places of people who just sort of see through the, you know, convoluted and, you know, cretinous moral relativism of, you know, this sort of dominant opinion. And this dominant opinion, I think, has been exposed as a failure. I mean, I, I, just to bring in something that, it, 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 and this person has nothing to do with what just happened, but... In America, as you probably may have followed, there's a kind of controversy with Rob Malley, who was the envoy to restarting the negotiations with Iran. Well, you know, back when Obama was running for president, he was an informal Middle East advisor and had to leave because at the time, you know, he, he was open about meeting with Hamas leaders. Well, anyway, he was brought back in in 2013, and, you know, for a while it seemed like the Democratic Party had sort of moved to where... Mali is, but I think this is a moment where you like look back and you can find him, you know, in documentaries and in panel discussions online talking about how, you know, they're not crazy. We have to listen to them. They have their own logic. You know, they also have social organizations. Those, that, uh, this thing, even though anyone who's been paying attention and knows how barbaric Hamas has been since 1987 when they were formed, um, this is this is going to have a lot of ripple effects. And so I am not so sure that it's going to be like in four days. Yes, you will hear those voices. I don't think they're going to have an effect on Israel. And I'm hopeful, although I don't want to get too hopeful. But, you know, based on what President Biden said yesterday, my hope is that he will, um, you know, stay the course. If he doesn't, which is 
possible. There are things that the United States can do to pressure Israel, but it would be, in my view, I think it would be a political suicide for him and his party. Because I think the American I, people, I, this is the weird thing, is that we're seeing these pockets of the left showing us, telling us who they are. And I think that we're also, what we're not really counting on is that I think there's so many normal Americans who look at this and they say, wipe these savages off the face of the map. And I think that that is a I mean, very human response. And I think most normal people think that. And, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to be a political genius to figure out that that's, that's probably where you want to be in the 2024 election. I really hope you're right. So what do you think about Netanyahu and his uh, place right now in the Israeli mind, as far as you can tell? Well, um, you know, I, I, I was, we talked about this before. I was critical of his outreach to the Judeo-fascists. Um, and I'd written about that. I thought that the protests were way overboard. And I had some sympathy for judicial reform, although I'm not an expert in it. And I, I tended to sort of, you know, want to hear both sides. And I wasn't passionate, but I do think that the judiciary probably has too much power. But at this point, none of that really matters. What right. matters is that, that Netanyahu believed that he could manage the conflict with Gaza and that it was, that he, that it was in Israel's strategic interest to leave a weakened Hamas in place. And, and by leave a weakened Hamas, you mean protect its rule in Gaza well, not to protect, some extent. But to mow the grass. To the idea would be that you would preserve preserve the right. The but Hamas, we're, we're not we, we don't have anything to do with Gaza. We're not going to reoccupy it. So better that they're run by these lunatics. And there was a logic to that. And it's not, and it's not it wasn't just that. The logic was even more complicated because he was thinking that the, the thinking was that a Hamas in Gaza weakens the Palestinian Authority. So having an equilibrium between the two of them is in Israel's best interest. Yeah, but interest. I don't want to, I got to say, we, I don't want to, I mean, yes, that is, this was Netanyahu's approach. But it was also the approach of the national security establishment for Israel. I don't know, I'm not, I'm not criticizing yeah, yeah. No, it. No, no, and, 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 and in, it fairness, complicated. in fairness, it worked. Even I mean, I, for what it's worth, it, it, it I was against it. It worked for 10 it. years. What? It worked for 10 years. It did. And it works until it doesn't work. But right. now it is abundantly clear that, you know, we, we, they cannot exist. So, you know, and so in that respect, yes, it's very sad what's going to happen and is happening. There will be innocents who were killed and, and, and it's, it's deeply unfair to the Palestinians who are going to have to suffer. But I'm sorry, but the primary person or entity to blame for that is Hamas, not just because they no. invited the attack. It's also because they use, they use their own population as human shields. That is, it is, it is something that they seek to do, which is to, they want, they want dead babies. And so that's why they launch their missiles from hospitals and schools and mosques. And that's why they have weapons depots there. And, and that's why whenever Israel tries to, to, convince citizens to evacuate certain areas, certain neighborhoods, certain buildings, Hamas counter offends with stay put because yeah. they want, do they want savagery. They want those, the, the pictures of the right. carnage. Because they are right. And it's, it, and it is an untenable situation and it has to end. And I, I'm, I'm pleased to see that the goal of these military operations is to wipe out their leadership, which is exactly what has to happen. I, it's one of my, it's, it's, it's a cliche in Israeli society. And I'm, I'm, I've been, ha in all my conversations recently, I've been hammering the importance of sometimes clinging to those cliches because they, as much as I'm a, a, an anti cliche um, crusader, those, those specific cliches sometimes, sometimes some of our tacky uh, ideas of ourselves are the DNA of our moral ethos and holding on to them actually long-term shapes our behavior for the better or for worse. And one of those cliches in the context of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is that Israel is a culture of life and, and Hamas is the culture of death or a cult of death. This was captured so perfectly in, in the videos circulating recently of mobs of Jewish vigilantes trying to get to uh, an injured Palestinian in order to exact uh, mob justice. And it's been shared mostly by people trying to show, look, the Israelis are just as barbarian. So, but the context is that those barbarians are known 
quantity barbarians are, are uh, a minority in Israel that is known as the La Familia, an actual gang, an actual Jewish supremacist gang that most Israelis deplore. But more importantly, and this is the, the systemic expression of these cliches of the ethos of life, what the video actually shows is Israeli police dragging out and violently, dragging out violently Jews in order to protect an injured Hamas terrorist after the massacre who's currently being treated in an Israeli hospital. And it's an Israeli hospital treating a Hamas ter- Hamasic terrorist. That, to me, is amazing. When Baruch Goldstein shot up a mosque, and I believe it was 1994, 1995, the entire Jewish world, the Israeli government, came down on him and, and expressed that this 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 animal brought shame upon our people. If Baruch Goldstein was an Islamist in Gaza, there would be uh, posters of him glorifying his martyrdom. Let, uh, and again, let, let that sink in. Let it sink in. And it's what the frustration here is that it would take something this horrific for us to believe what these fucking animals in Hamas have been telling us since they began. It's in their charter. Kill the Jews. And, like, I think that there's a problem in the West in dealing with this, I've called it the weak fascist problem. That if a group is fascist, but they don't have the same amount of power as the group that they're fighting, then we somehow do not understand that the that if they did have that power, they would be Nazis. Or they, you know, they're Nazis. If they had that power, they would implement these horrific things. So, you know, I, it's like... I, Which leads to the moral justification that because you're powerless, you are actually justified in, in, yes. in celebrating it's martyrs. It's in absolutely celebrating absurd. Murders. And, but I do want to raise maybe a, a harder question, which I, I struggle with. I have made the point on Twitter, I've made the point, I I was on the Fifth Column podcast uh, this week, that, you know, Hamas has stood for one election, which they won narrowly for the Palestinian legislature. They have not stood for elections, and so I don't think we can say that the people of Gaza support Hamas. But I also don't know that we can say they don't. And um, that at a certain point, you know, the brainwashing, the programming... Um, which Hamas and their patrons pour a lot of money into. I mean, it, I think it does have an effect. It's child abuse. They've, they've turned their children into monsters. Now, not all of them. I mean, it's incredible. I mean, I, nonetheless, people are, we've seen occasional flickers of protest. We know that you, you don't really have a choice. You have to go along with this kind of awful Jew hating um, because they are, you know, a vicious gang, and they will they they will punish you. They will torture you. They will they will imprison you if if you if you go against the law, and they'll call you an Israeli spy. But on the other hand, um, when I saw officials from the Palestinian Authority on some of the news networks claiming that civilians were not attacked because all of those people were settlers, when I saw them denying what was plain. Uh, when I saw them refusing to denounce this, even though people you would think in the PLO who are rivals to Hamas would have every motivation to denounce it, that does raise an awful question about what is wrong with Palestinian culture. And I hate to ask it because I think that that can lead to a lot of dark places. And I know plenty of individual Palestinians who absolutely loathe Hamas even more than me because they see how dangerous they are. So I don't, it's not everybody or anything like that. But there is something that we have to sort of address here because not everybody who was cheering the mutilated body of that woman on the back of the flatbed truck this weekend in Gaza City was compelled to do so. Some of that is who they are. Maybe. I don't, I really feel like we have no tools right now to I really... Agree. No, I agree. I start off by saying it. we don't know. Yeah, no, 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 I know, I know. I'm, I'm yeah. bringing this back because I really don't feel comfortable in any direction. I think that this is, 
this could well be true, but it also could not be. And I don't know how to approach this because we know for a fact that there are non-Hamas affiliated Gazans who fully support it or at least are quite happy with the with the sight of the carnage because this is like like I said this is the culture the the pleasure they get is from massacring Jews and on the other end you see Gazans non-affiliated uh, with Hamas who are terrified for their lives not from Israel but from Hamas and, yeah, and I agree would, it's a complicated question that's why I wanted to sort of set it up yeah, as, yeah, yeah. I, mm-hmm. I pose it as a question I'll just add one more thing yeah I had an experience over the summer. I visited the first time in my life a concentration camp. So I, I visited Dachau. And I went and I wanted to sort of see it alone for myself. And as I'm going through the camp and I'm reading about it and, you know, I'm, I'm fairly knowledgeable about the history of World War II and the Holocaust. Um, I found myself being overcome with not just rage, but the sort of visualizing a kind of violent fantasy of murdering one of these SS guards. And it's a very human instinct. And so I just, I just would say that. It's not an excuse. It's not to say that this pogrom is because of the dispossession and occupation and what did you expect decolonization to look like. That is not what I'm saying. I am saying that when you have a culture that um, from the very youngest age with children, you know, gives a version of Sesame Street that glorifies suicide bombers, that glorifies the Palestinian Baruch Goldsteins, um, we might have a, a, a bigger problem than we, we would like to think. Let me, let me say exactly the same thing slightly differently. It's... N- n- human nature to feel uh, an uncontrollable desire to seek justice in the bloodiest sense on people who have wronged you, even in the abstract. Yeah. Even if you just have the notion of being wronged by these people, if the if the wrong is severe Or enough, even if, it's your, if uh, your grandparents were wrong, then you... If it's your story, so, yeah. But... What matters is how we've been cultured to process this rage and and how we've taught ourselves to think it through, moderate it, and be more reflexive of the bigger value of either human life or of a deeper sense of civilizational existence. And these are the values that define a culture. And the question is whether the decision of death cults in the fight against Israel to completely eschew any sort of prosperity-based, humanity-based vision of the future and completely devote themselves to destruction and the glorification of this very primal human urge is something that we can overcome or is it, uh, are we too far gone? Yes. And I would just mm-hmm. say this, that when you deal, and that was, I mean, listen, I mean, I don't have a memory of the Holocaust happening in real time. Fortunately, my family was out of Europe by then. It's, but just the power of that rage can consume you. And if you, I'm just saying, I mean, like you can have all of those restraints, but I, you can also see that if somebody is, has experienced something horrific, and by the way, this works On the other side, too, Um, the IDF soldiers who are going into Gaza, if they knew people, they had families and relatives in those kibbutzim where they went house to house. I mean, I would be consumed with a kind of rage, and I don't know that you could talk me out of it. And that, that's a very human thing. And you just have to, gotta, you know, just recognize it. (laughs) Like, Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm reminded, too, of what you first said at the beginning of our conversation, Eli, about how how <laughs> how racist it is against Palestinians to be painting them as if it, this was the same brush yeah. of what's happening now. And I think it's it's it there are many, many marginalized groups. There are many people who have been oppressed. There are many people who have suffered 
atrocities and they do not necessarily answer with atrocities. Yeah, that's true. In return, right? And I think... Like the Jewish uh, people, yes. Like the Jewish Although people there and were many, Jewish many atrocities, others. We should say there were atrocities in 48. Of course. There have been atrocities yeah. in Jewish wars, absolutely. But the, the experience of atrocity does not justify the perpetuation of atrocity, right? And we should be able to to understand that fact when we're evaluating world events. Well, I would say that in most events. cases you're right. But, I mean, there's a famous story about when the Americans liberated Dachau. And there were the guards and then there were these emaciated prisoners. And the prisoners began with what little strength they had, literally beating to death in a brutal and savage way. And the commander of the American unit told his guys to let it happen. And then that's a situation where I would say, yes, let it happen. The liberation of Dachau, you don't think that I, the, I, guards again, deserve, did the guards deserve to did right. the guards deserve to be lynched? I think they did. Let me give you let me give you a different question. Okay. Deserve is not the question, I think. Right, right. Right. Exactly. The yeah. and, and certainly not I, I, I'm not sure the question is what what I feel and what they deserve, because the answer for both of these are easy for me. But here's a different question that I've been trying to work out with a friend. So you know how the Ben Gvir government was trying to advance the a law that will allow the execution of terrorists. I think we talked about this last time. Something that I'm very uncomfortable with, especially because of the very loose definition of what constitutes a terrorist. But it, even beyond that, even if you can really find airtight due process for capital punishment in Israel, it still changes Israel's understanding of what it is. Israel decidedly outlawed capital punishment and only created an exception for the execution of Eichmann. Bringing it back is signaling that we are turning into something a little darker, maybe not significantly darker, maybe it's pragmatically necessary to embrace this dark approach for deterrence or some other kind of I mean, but natural I, strategy. A, I have a problem with the whole construction. Israelis have no problem killing terrorists. I don't know. I think what do there's you mean? A, they, they, they do operations all the time where they kill terrorists. They have targeted, yes, target killings. You're right. There are, they, they, I mean, may, maybe you're right. But this is actually my point. And there's no due process in that. It's just. Right, right. There's even le- less due process than that because theoretically they count them as combatants. But, you, but no, I actually agree with the, this point. My point is that it's less about due process and less about the, uh, whether capital punishment is a good strategy, um, criminologically speaking. My question is, does that that shift, that internal shift in Israeli identity matter? Because I think it does. I think part, it, it was part of the, these internal set of cliches and um, hypocrisies that shaped the, 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 the Israeli embrace of life and, be, uh, and sense of moral superiority. The, the ex- exclusion of capital punishment was part of that, part of those set of beliefs. And if Baruch Goldstein had lived after his massacre, I wouldn't have a problem executing him. Again, morally, I wouldn't have a problem with that. I like that we would not have. So but so you would not have a problem with this. You don't think that this, in a way... I didn't have a problem when... I mean, listen, I didn't even have a problem. Like, you know, there was a big debate in 2006 when they were trying Saddam Hussein. And my only problem with when he was executed was not the fact that there were some solderists who, you know, captured his death on cell phone video. That I, I didn't particularly care. Um, my only problem was that I would like to have seen trials for his other many crimes. But, um, yeah, the only thing you can do with Saddam Hussein, the only thing you can do with an Ismail Haniyeh is, uh, you know, bullet in the back of the head. I mean, I'm sorry, there's evil in the world, and I don't think that Israel is less moral or less dedicated to life. In fact, I think that there's an argument that, in a sense, by defending the Jewish state, by killing the people who would do great harm to the Jews... They are defending life. I mean, I believe that if Hamas is wiped out and you can get some sort of Palestinian authority with other Arab states in a kind of interim, I mean, this is a big if and if and if, and maybe I'm wish casting, Mm -hmm. but if you can get to a point where there's another election in Gaza and they can, you know, bring in a more moderate and pragmatic, you know, governance, then I, I would give the IDF a Nobel Peace Prize. Because part of... Peace and security is the 
vigilant, relentless, and resolute defeat of people and groups that seek nothing but war. There is something different for me morally, but maybe it's a distinction without a difference. No, 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 it's of, okay. I mean, like, there's a lot of people who disagree of with killing that. Some, of killing an uh, uh, enemy in the field or if they're in their hideout and the only way to get to them is through really targeted assassination and being able to grab hold of them, arresting them, and then executing them. So even without passing judgment on the morality of it, it's just different for me. Okay. So, and I think part of the reason that it's different for me is because I was raised Israeli. So I've always been taught to feel it, uh, to, to develop a certain emotional distinction, discernment between those two approaches to executing an enemy. And one of them feels wrong. One of them we've been taught, we've been inculcated from day one in Israel is something that we do not do. Right. You're seeing, what was it that David said in your conversation, the, the moral injury? It would, right. it would injure the, the Israeli soul yep. to go down that path in a way that Americans, we don't have that like that is not part of our character our, like we believe in I mean, corporal you're, you're, punishment yeah, your I moral suppose soul see, sees value in, allows for yeah, execution and just eliminating evil from this world right. well I mean listen it's it's a it's a dangerous intoxicant this approach mm. and it can easily lead to injustice if you apply it mm. too broadly but I don't I think Hamas in this case is an, is an easy case um and it's also, you know, this, it, you know, it, it it's a clarifying moment. You can't live with in a world with these people, yeah. and 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 that's why I'm not entirely sure that it's going to be like other wars that Israel has waged in the past. Because I, it's going to be very hard. These are well documented, and they're really the reason that you're seeing this dominating the news in this way, and kind of leading to this engagement and everybody kind of being sucked into this is because you can't look away. Just to give an example, in 2013, 2014, if you remember, um, ISIS beheaded on video one of the aid workers. Yeah. American opinion turns overnight and Barack Obama is back in Iraq. Th that was his big accomplishment. I ended the Iraq war and he sends guys back into Iraq and the air, you know, and Syria and we have this war against ISIS, and the war against ISIS was successful, by the way. So I, I guess, you know, what I'm saying is that was a hinge moment, and that brutal scene of just one person being beheaded on video was enough to turn the a tide of opinion in the, a superpower. This is like 1,000 beheading videos and what they might do with these hostages. And there are Americans involved. I just don't think you can turn around even in a month and say, okay, you've done it enough. Yeah, there will be voices that will talk about it and there will be casualties. And in the end, some moral idiot will say something like, well, you know, 6,000 Palestinians were killed and only 1,500 Israelis were killed. But I just think that that's only going to work for the other zombies. It's not going to work for the rest of us. And I think we outnumber them by a lot. I, uh, the, the idea of we can't live in a world with them reminds me of Hannah Arendt's final lines in the, uh, the Banality of Evil because she didn't oppose the execution of Eichmann, but she opposed the terms under which it was justified as an exception in the Israeli law. And I, I, I had to look it up while you were talking to find it. And it was, uh, it, it was exactly about inhabiting the same world and she says um blah 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 um and just as you supported and carried out a policy of not wanting to share this is aren't saying what the uh prosecutors should or, or sorry the judges should have said in justifying the execution and just as you supported and carried out a policy of not wanting to share the earth with the jewish people and the people of a number of other nations as though you and your superiors had any right to determine who should and should not inhabit the world we find that no one that is no member of the human race can be expected to want to share the earth with you this is the reason and the only reason you must hang 
I had some issues with banality of ish- evil, but that was a very good line. I've had it already. I, I, kind of, I knew that this is exactly what you're going to say. It's like, I knew that you're going to cringe at the fact that you're about to agree with Hannah Arendt. Hey, I, you know, it's, it's interesting because I don't really like Chuck Schumer right now or Kathy Hochul, but they had very strong condemnations of the NSA rally. I, I, can we make this a thing? Can we make NSA a thing? Like, let's just... I, I'm, I'm, I'm joining you. I'm joining yeah, yeah. you. I'm the first recruit. All right, listen, before we go, I have to ask, because the two of you are based in Brooklyn. Queens. Queens. Oh, okay, Queens. But you're in the hipster land. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hipster Jason. Okay. Yeah. Are any of your friends getting sucked into this decolonization nonsense? Okay, so a friend of mine who lives in one of my favorite neighborhoods in the world, Astoria, has t- reported that so many of the shops that she loves have had pro-Palestinian paraphernalia put out. S- not a good sign. She tried to get into a conversation with some of them because she cares about the neighborhood very much so, and texted them, tried to, you know, maybe you should read the right articles to change your mind about this. She's a newly converted Jew, so she's still very optimistic about the power of such communications to change people's minds. The responses she got were as discouraging as you can imagine. Mostly just expressing the sort of lazy attachment to what they think is a trendy belief without realizing that the overtone window may have shifted back. Kind of cute. They, they're surprised that they're now being under assault by people calling them insanely genocidal and racist. They never expected that this could ever happen. And, they're, and, and they feel hey, indignant. Th- didn't, didn't this crowd start punch a Nazi? Well, punch yourselves. But that's that's that, that's some that's some of the yeah. signals that I'm, I've been getting. And from the other side, I've get I've got distant friends or second degree friends who are like, "Can you explain to me?" Because I don't understand. Because Hamas clearly doesn't intend to kill civilians. Oh, so really? how? Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Okay, Vanessa. Mm-hmm. Not in my circles that I've seen. Um, someone I know uh, works in a. Uh, a f- very lefty, left-leaning organization. And I think she's coming up against it and hearing about it. But, uh, and then she asked me a, a, a similar question. Like, I, but wait a minute, isn't Hamas different from Palestine? I don't understand why they're getting upset like right now. So I think there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of people who under who instinctively understand that this is the wrong response, but don't exactly know the intricacies of why or the details of why. Mm, okay. Um, one more thing. I just, Wanted to uh, maybe just in our cathartic in our mutual catharsis, Adam and Vanessa. Did you see? So the Israeli defense minister said, "You know, it's all out war," and then he said, "You know, we're fighting animals." And then I noticed the um, National Socialist crowd seizing on that, saying, "This is the rhetoric of the Nazis." And I was like, no, he called Hamas animals. And, and, you know, my response is, and I've been, you know, out there on Twitter, as you guys know, I was like, and that, frankly, it's an insult to beasts to call them animals. They're worse than animals. They're fucking demons. But my question to you is, I mean, like, am I getting too emotional? Like, am I wrong? Like, it, it, you know, Israelis should refrain from that kind of la- rhetoric or like, I'm like, who cares? I I usually this is this is the thing that I feel the the cleanse that I mentioned earlier. Normally, I would say, of course, we should refrain from this kind of language, even though I wholly agree with it. I stand by this. I yeah, have no exactly. They're qualms. yeah, exactly. They're, Not the Palestinians. I mean, I mean, I mean what, 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 also, also yeah. you know what? You know what? We'll just pause. Like this is me getting into my loop of like, yeah. Let me think about the complexity. Like, wait, we're talking about people who went into villages of civilians on the intention of massacring civilians, achieved said intention, massacred at least, and counting, 1,200 people, carted off elderly children, women, in trucks to be held hostage in Gaza for or later executed, Filmed all that, celebrated all that, had smiley cheering emojis attached to the slaughter of civilians, showed the mangled bodies of women that they've just raped and murdered, and, and while they're smiling and, and celebrating, playing happy, cheery music around it. And now we're thinking about whether or not we should be calling these monsters monsters. Give me a fucking break. 
Yes. Can I just, I'll share one more <laughs> thing of, of my kind of Twitter experiences here. There yeah. was, uh, sadly, I, there is a speak, there is a, there is a, a kind of a Jew that goes to a dark place. So there's this guy who's like, my grandparents are Holocaust survivors, but I know that, you know, as that I will not judge the, and it's like the military tactics of any oppressed people fighting, you know, from a ghetto, whether it's the Warsaw ghetto or Hamas. And I just lit this guy the up. The Warsaw ghetto did not escape the ghetto in order to massacre neighboring Polish civilians. It's absurd. And more what importantly, are you talking about? more importantly, what the fuck this are you guy, talking about? I want to name this guy. Hold on just a second, because I really feel like. <laughs> please do. Uncertain. No, please do. This nonsense. This idea of the Warsaw ghetto. I've seen this cliche come You've up seen so it? many yeah, yeah, times. Exactly. Do you know what the Warsaw ghetto is? Do you fucking know, A, what happened in the Warsaw Ghetto? When the Warsaw Ghetto Rebellion happened, it happened in response to an action where the Nazis came in to destroy, eliminate the ghetto, to exterminate every single person there. Israelis are trying to save civilians in Gaza. We are, we are warning buildings at the expense of maybe alerting the terrorists that we're trying to get in order to save civilians. We are sending messages. We are sending warning shots in order for the civilians to evacuate the buildings, even if that means losing the actual targets that we are seeking because we want to preserve life in this enemy region because we appreciate life even when they are under opposition government. Okay, can I, I, gotta, I, gotta, let, you know what, I, I know, I know I'm a glutton for punishment. This. I know, okay, and let me, I know I'm a glutton for punishment here. This guy's <laughs> name is Nathan Tankus, okay, and I'm just gonna, let me just read you the tweet, okay? He's writing a book, by the way. He's yeah. an academic. Let me be crystal clear. As a Jewish grandchild of Holocaust survivors... So also, also, anybody who starts with a sentence, let me be crystal clear, is already using this time. It's like saying, um, this is the time when you're trying to process the sentence. S sentences like, let me be crystal clear, is when you are shielding yourself with mangled euphemisms and cliches and twisted logic. Yeah. Okay. Let me be crystal clear. As a Jewish grandchild of Holocaust survivors, I am always on the side of the people imprisoned in ghettos and not on the incredibly armed and modern army who serves as their jailers. You're not going to be able to bully me into another opinion. I don't want anyone to die, but I also don't, won't participate in contextless haranguing of military strategy launched from a ghetto, whether it's Jewish partisans during World War II or, yes, even Hamas. Whether or not I, Jewish writer living in New York, Criticize Hamas is irrelevant. The only thing that truly matters coming from a U.S. citizen is whether you are truly against the occupation and want to see it ended, including the, uh, through ending U.S. aid to Israel, and whether you don't. The rest is just noise. Nathan Tankus, if you have some rotten fruit and you see him, I wouldn't be against you throwing it at him. This guy, to, to, to describe... I offer just ignore, but okay. rotten fruit is within the acceptable norm of... Yes, exactly. Reality. Don't hurt him, but uh, this guy who has the audacity to say, I'm a grandchild of Holocaust survivors. You are disgracing your family and your people. I hope you get, like, disgusting like hemorrhoids or something like yeah. fuck you <laughs> thank so you your question are we are we being a little uh, are we emotional right now yes i think i think we might be a little emotional right now Yes, I think this is a good time to note that this will be a more explicit episode than usual. If you're watching with young children at home, perhaps <laughs> wait until later or put on the headphones. Um, two things before we dive into it. Um, and I mean, for obvious reasons, I am less active in this conversation than than you and Eli, but I do want to comment on on something that you that you've brought up, which is, you know, the kind of ethos of uncertain things, to explore things from both sides, to criticize rhetoric and ideology on the left and the right, um, to not take stories that you hear in the narrative as given, to understand that there's complexity behind most of most of 
what what we're seeing in the world today and to give space for that complexity. However, <laughs> um, we've talked about this. You and I are very naturally inclined towards seeing things on both sides, towards intellectualizing um, sympathy, empathy for people, and assuming good intent, trying to unravel logic. And these are all like relatively positive qualities in us as humans, but it, it doesn't ab- abnegate us from understanding what is right and what is wrong and understanding that in fact there are things that are just so clearly black and white, even though mo- so much of the world is gray. There are things that are clearly right and that are clearly wrong. And I do think it's important, you know, with all of all of the the news cycle and the reaction, there's people are gonna get, you know, sucked into the stupid cancel culture-ish, whatever dichotomy. And it's like, you know as a human <laughs> what is right and what is wrong. Um, and I think it's important for for thinking, feeling moral people to say so. Um, I'm not on the like, you know, at the level of Adam and Eli in terms of like getting into Twitter fights with people because, you know, for that's not my style. But I still think that there's there should be some clarity in this moment. Um, and if you're not seeing why there's clarity, that's that's a problem. Um, <laughs> it, it does not come at the expense of complexity is what I'm trying to say. It's funny because I guess this the, the uncertain thing ethos is in our blood I listen to you and I'm like, yes, but <laughs> the idea of, I, I, I honestly don't think that there is a black and white. And I think this is the fundamental cognitive dissonance from which all other cognitive dissonances emerge. Moral relativism is correct. Subjectivism is correct. There is no moral truth. But there is the fact that there is no moral truth mean that you have no moral context in which you work, in which you operate? Or is the idea that you don't, there's no moral truth in this objective sense, just license for you to commit any act of savagery that gives you good vibes. And back to my point about committing to the cliches and committing to certain lies about ourselves, that is what shapes moral truths. There is no deeper sense. There is no way in which you dig deep into your heart or search far enough and refine your ideas in a Kantian way in order to extract this moral imperative. You build an ethos from the cultural stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and you commit to them. And if the American left progressives want to commit to a new myth, a myth of true tribalism and brutality, completely abandon the story of a universal human experience in the name of fuck you gut mine, then so be it. But now we know what it means. Now we know what it looks like. Mm. I, I, I... I also don't want to come across as if I'm saying that because there is moral clarity that there's, I think you're also kind of hinting at this, that there's justification for acting out or like, I mean, we're going to get into this with the conversation with Eli because I think he has a slightly different line on this. But for me personally, just because someone has some sense of moral clarity here, it doesn't, (laughs) doesn't mean that all actions are then justified in response in response to that like there you still need to hold yourself to a moral standard um but i do think that mo- moments like this of clarity are important on a societal level and also on an on an individual level i mean you and i were talking about this in kind of more personal context but there's there's a difference between acceptance and forgiveness and When you see, when someone has wronged you or has done something wrong, you don't have to accept it. 
but you can forgive it if you choose to. Now, this is obviously, I would not, I'm not not trying to draw a parallel here. I don't think we should forgive Hamas. This is unforgivable. Um, but oh, no. there is a difference uh, between seeing something as right and wrong and then how you choose to act in the face of that wrongness, right? And so I just wanted to to bring that up as something to think about as people are having these right. <laughs> conversations and debate. <laughs> it's actually um, a good, good opportunity for me to lodge in one thought that I didn't get to say while recording the conversation with Eli, which is in regards to cancel culture now coming for the left from some people, because in response to some of the comments that have been made on the left in the past few uh, days, hours, which were explicitly supporting the Hamas massacre. Some employers said, I want to know the names of these people who are endorse- in colleges and universities who are endorsing these actions so that I can make sure not to hire them. And this is uh, <laughs> the classic moment of my how have the tides have turned. <laughs> I'm... There's a deeper discussion of this matter on the advisory opinions episode I produced today for with David French and Sarah Isger, and you can listen to that. Maybe it will be in the show notes. But and I think there are two issues. First, and this is for another time, the fault is not with moron college students. The fault is with the universities that cultivate them and and never push back and have let this culture fester and I am being radicalized in my pre-existing skepticism and rage at the predatory Ponzi scheme that is American elite universities. But there's a second issue, which is forgiveness. And people can grow out of their early perceptions or even midlife perceptions. People can evolve and this is something that critics of cancel culture were saying to the left and this is something that we need to say to ourselves now. And that's a little addendum that I didn't get to mention to Eli. I think, mm-hmm. unless you have something more to say. I have one last, one last thing to say. Okay. Um, which is, I do want to just take a moment to recognize that <laughs> you have been through the ringer the last few days, and despite it all, you've gone on multiple podcasts, including this one, which is not which is not like a, a little thing either, because the stakes are so high for you and your everyone who's listening to you, and all of your family and friends who are going to want to hear what you have to say and. F- feel like you're going to represent the situation clearly and well. And I did just want to take a moment to acknowledge that you've stepped up in this moment, done your best. And also, despite the fact that you're grieving a a, a sense of your country, a sense of what was, like, I know you're in shock and it's all being repressed and pushed down, but I do just want to acknowledge that it's not a small thing that you're talking, having these conversations, doing the work. Um, And and despite it all, and despite all the rage, you're still trying and grasping for understanding good faith. And I I just wanted to acknowledge that, that it's it's an important thing that you're doing. And it's, um, I think, a testament to your character. Uh, We'll see about that. (laughs) <laughs> but thank you and on that note time for some unadulterated rage with Eli Lake <laughs>